Welcome to CFRI Cystic Fibrosis Community Voices, a video podcast series created by and for the cystic fibrosis community. Hello, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Siri Vaith, Executive Director of the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute, CFRI. And it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome you to this special webinar, which is part of our CF Community Voices podcast series. The reason for this webinar is obvious. Health insurance is such a huge issue for all of us in the CF community. But it was interesting, we recently uh, completed our biennial community survey. And one theme that came up regularly in response to the question, what resources do you need? What information would be helpful to you? What can CFRI do to help you? Was related to insurance and all the many issues related to it and the challenges on deciding on policies, how to get coverage, um, how to get the best coverage for specifically for CF care. So uh, in response, of course, we went to the person who has helped countless people I'm sure thousands and thousands of people navigate the insurance uh, SSI, SSDI maze. And that, of course, is the fabulous Bessetian, who is known by many as the, all capital letters, the national expert on CF and SSDI benefits. Um, but before we dive in, uh, and I turn the mic over to Beth, I have some housekeeping. First, um, remember that this is a webinar. You're going to receive lots of information. Um, but before making any decisions or changes to your healthcare mm -hmm. plans, to please, please consult with an expert in your specific area to discuss your individual needs. I also want to thank our sponsors, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, Kies USA, Viatris, and uh, also Gilead Sciences that has provided additional support for this specific webinar. Mm. We are really grateful for their support. And lastly, there is a chat box and a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please, please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. And after best presentation, she will address your questions. And so enough of the housekeeping, on to the substance. I am honored to introduce Beth Sifian. She's an attorney and director of the Cystic Fibrosis Social Security Project, which helped people with CF to apply for social security benefits. She's also the director of the CF Legal Information Hotline, which provides free and confidential information about laws that protect people with cystic fibrosis. An adult with CF best serves on the CF Roundtable Board of Directors, where she writes a column about legal issues impacting our community. Beth, we are so grateful to you for all you do to support the CF community, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Welcome. Thank you, Siri. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. And uh, I thank you for inviting me and also for all you do to help the CF community. Uh, CFRI is just a wonderful organization and I have been helped throughout the years by uh, uh, in the past speaking and attending your co yearly conference. And then in the past two years, attending your adult CF retreat virtually. Uh, which literally saved me <laughs> during uh, during the beginning of COVID and then middle of COVID and now um, continues to provide me with support from uh, wonderful adults with CF. So thank you so much. Um, we are going to talk today about a lot of things related to insurance. Um, and I do want to say today is November 18th, 2021. So the information presented is good as of today, but things can change. Um, and so you should always make sure that the information you're provided with um, related to insurance and social security is still the same. Um, because right now, if you've been paying attention to the news, there is a spending bill that's now being debated in Congress. And it has a lot of good changes for people who have chronic illness and who have insurance or who have Medicare. So keep an eye on that bill if that bill is passed with the sections that are in it right now. Um, there will be a lot of additional help for people with CF, especially for people on Medicare and especially for people who are in need of low income Medicaid. 
um, but their state has not expanded Medicaid. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but I just wanted to say that um, at the beginning. Um, so this presentation is informational only. Nothing in the presentation is intended to be legal advice. The opinions expressed in this presentation are exclusively mine, Beth Suffian's, um, and they're not the opinions of, of anyone else. All right, so here's my hair pre-COVID when it was being dyed and now <laughs> post-COVID I am, you know, decided to go gray and show my 56 years uh, of living on earth, which has turned my hair gray. Uh, I'm a partner in Suffian and Passamano, which is a law firm in Houston, Texas. And we are a firm of eight people. We mainly focus on helping people with cystic fibrosis around the country. As Siri says, I'm director of the CF Legal Information Hotline and of the Social Security Project. And I've been practicing law for 31 years. I'm 56, I have CF. Um, and people, for some reason, always want to know if I've had a transplant, and I have not had a transplant. Uh, so there you go. Uh, the CF Legal Information Hotline began in 1998, and we have received over 100,000 calls. We can provide free and confidential information on the laws that protect people with CF. We receive funding from the CF Foundation to run the hotline, but we are not employees of the CF Foundation. So the best way to reach us is by email, which is cflegal at suffianpasamano.com. If you don't have access to email, you can call us at 1-800-622-0385, but you will just leave a voicemail and then we will have to figure out how to get in contact with you. So email um, is the best way to reach us. You don't need a referral from anyone. You can reach out directly to us. So the CF Social Security Project allows us to provide representation at no cost to a person with CF in an application for Social Security benefits or in a continuing disability review. And there's lots of continuing disability reviews going on right now. So if you do receive one, please reach out to us so we, we can see if we can assist you. So we can provide services to people with CF more than once. So if we helped you 10 years ago and you need help now, we can help you again. If we helped you one year ago and you now have the need for additional representation, we can help you. You don't need a referral. You can contact us directly. And again, this project is generously supported by the CF Foundation and we're thankful for their support, but we are not employees of the CF Foundation. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a lot of things related to insurance. Um, when I, I've been working on this uh, speech for about two weeks, uh, and I was telling my law partner that, you know, this could be an eight hour talk. So because we don't worry, it's not going to be an eight hour talk, we're going to try to have about 30 to 40 minutes and then have questions. Um, but we're not gonna be able to talk about every possible insurance issue. So if there is something that I don't talk about and you wanna post it in the Q&A, we could you know, certainly talk about it then. And you can also contact us and set up a time uh, to talk so on the CF hotline. So we're also gonna talk about a really hot topic now, which is, if you're on social security disability or SSI, how could you retain the insurance portion of the benefit if you wanna to return to work? So we are gonna start off talking about private insurance, Affordable Care Act insurance, a little bit about Medicaid, but then we're gonna talk about issues related to social security. And we're getting hundreds and hundreds of calls a month about that which is good. The reason is because people are feeling better. Some people, uh, some people are and wanting to return to work, but want to make sure that they either have access to insurance through the Affordable Care Act or maintain either Medicaid or Medicare. So that's kind of tricky. And we're going to talk about or a little complicated. We'll talk about that at the second part of the talk. So the, the first thing that's really important to understand is that the term disability is defined in each law that we're going to talk about. So just because you are meeting the definition of disabled under 
the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't mean you meet the standard for social security benefits. Or if you meet the definition for a person who's disabled under a federal education law dealing with people with disabilities does not mean that you are considered disabled by social security. So make sure when you're trying to get protection under a certain law that you understand the definition of disability for that law. So we first want to talk about the Affordable Care Act, which was passed in 2010, which is now 11 years ago. Um, but we still have calls every day of people who don't know what the Affordable Care Act is and what help that it could give to people with CF who need insurance coverage. Um, sometimes people know of the Affordable Care Act under the name Obamacare. And Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are the same thing. So if you know about Affordable Care Act, that's the same thing as Obamacare. And Obamacare is the same thing as Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act in 2010 um, made a dramatic improvement to the ability of people with CF to obtain insurance coverage. And that's because the law said there are no more pre-existing condition exclusions from coverage. So prior to the ACA, a, a policy could say, if you had a condition prior to enrolling on this policy, we don't have to cover it. So that is no longer allowed on policies that um, are covered by the Affordable Care Act. So there's no additional premiums for pre-existing conditions. So for a policy uh, that you get through your employer or through the Affordable Care Act, that policy cannot rate the policy up. They can't charge you more because you have cystic fibrosis or another pre-existing condition. Another great thing it did was said, if you're on your parents' insurance, you can stay on for 20, till you're 26. So it used to be 18 for most policies, but now you have the chance to stay on until you turn 26. And if you're married prior to 26, you can still stay on your parents' policy. There's no lifetime cap on coverage. So prior to the Affordable Care Act, if you needed a transplant, but you had used up the $500,000 cap on your uh, insurance policy, you wouldn't have enough coverage for a transplant. So no more lifetime caps on coverage. Limits on how much you have to pay out of pocket. Um, so right now it's about 7,000. It's a little bit more, I think it's like 7,000 something, like $7,080 I think is what it is. Um, and that'll change on January 1st. But that means that's the most you'll have to pay out. And after you do that, you're at 100%. That means the insurance will pay 100% of claims. Some policies you reach that out-of-pocket max earlier. So I know for my insurance, I reach it at about 6,800, so, so you'd have to check your insurance policy. And then lastly, the Affordable Care Act expanded Medicaid to low-income adults. Um, then the Supreme Court of the United States said that that could only be an option for states to do. And right now we have 38 states that have expanded Medicaid. So if you live in one of those states and you're low income, you can apply for Medicaid and you don't have to be on Social Security. So this is a map of the states that have not expanded Medicaid. Um, and two of the big ones are Texas, where I live, and Florida. Um, those are places where there are lots of people with CF. And so if you're low income and you need Medicaid and you're over 18, the way to do that is to be on SSI. So the bill that's pending in Congress, um, the, the spending bill that's being debated right now would allow people in those 12 states that have not expanded Medicaid, it would allow them to purchase a policy on the Affordable Care Act exchange without having to pay a premium. So, um, so that would be really helpful. We don't know if that's going to make it into the final bill, but it, if it does, that will dramatically help low-income adults with CF 
in these 12 uh, states. The reason that those people, that they in theory could buy an Affordable Care Act plan, but they don't get premium help, and that usually prevents people from purchasing the Affordable Care Act plan, um, but hopefully those people will have another option soon. So what, uh, how does the Affordable Care Act offer the ability to purchase insurance? So the things that we just talked about, no increase in premiums, maximum out of pocket, you can stay on until 26, that applies to any private policy in the United States. Um, so uh, you don't have to purchase a policy on a health insurance exchange to get that protection. Um, but if you want to get premium help, you would purchase a policy through the health insurance exchange. So that's going to be found at healthcare.gov. And some states have their own exchange. So if you go to healthcare.gov and you live in California, you're going to be routed to the California website that um, provides access to policies available in California. <clears throat> so it's this, this, uh, this podcast is very appropriate for right now because open enrollment for an Affordable Care Act plan started November 1st and it will end January 15th of 2022. So they have expanded the period of time you could enroll and if you enroll, you can see by December, my, now my thing is covering it, by December 15th, um, then you get a policy that begins on January 1st, okay? So if you enroll after December 15th, then you, your coverage will begin in most states on February 1st. So what happens if you don't enroll by January 15th because you have private insurance through your employer and then on February 1st, you lose your job? So you have different options for how to keep the insurance you had through your employer through COBRA. But if you want to purchase an ACA plan, you can get special enrollment if you've lost coverage that you had and you have 60 days to get special enrollment and purchase a plan through the, the Affordable Care Act. So also if you have a change in your household state, household size, change in your primary place of living, change in your eligibility for marketplace or an enrollment error, you can get special enrollment. So ACA plans, the main question we get almost every day, is do they cover modulators? Do the plans cover Trikafta or uh, Simdaco, Kaleidaco, or Cambi? So they do cover modulators and they cover 45, ACA plans must cover 45 different healthcare services. So there is um, sort of a bad information for some people in the CF community who think that the policies don't provide good coverage, and that is not correct. They provide very good coverage. Um, and right now there is a lot of premium help. So 80% of the people who have an ACA plan right now are paying zero premium. So if in the past you looked at an ACA plan and you thought the premium was too high, you should check again by going to healthcare.gov to see what the premium is now because the federal government has added a lot of premium help um, when you purchase an ACA plan um, on the exchange. You can also purchase your own plan. Go to an insurance agent and ask for a policy and you would not get premium help um, but if you don't need premium help or you're over the income for premium help, there's, uh, depending on your family size, you will have different amounts that you would have to pay a premium. So for example, if you make about $45,000 a year and you're an individual up to 45,000, you will get premium help. Um, so if you're just purchasing a plan on your own, you still have all those protections we talked about at the beginning um, for an ACA plan. 
So a lot of people um, seem to be talking lately about how do you choose a benefit plan um, and how do you know if it's a good plan? Generally, what we see is most people don't have a lot of choices on plans. Now, if, if you're going on to the ACA marketplace, you probably will have, you know, 10 or 20 different plans you can choose from. Some states like New York would have maybe 30 or 40 plans you could choose from. So that's when you have the most um, plans available. But for people that are employed and they're getting their insurance through the employer, most employers are going to offer one plan. Um, and very big employers may offer two or three plans. And so, of course, you want to look at certain things, mainly, will your CF center be covered? And will other physicians that treat you be covered? And if you're admitted at, at a hot, if, if your CF center is not attached to a hospital and you would need to be admitted, would that hospital be covered? And the main thing that people don't seem to understand, um, and, and so this is really important, is that most insurance policies, if not all insurance policies, but maybe a few don't do this or have a lot of choice, but most of them are contracting. So an insurance plan, is contracting with certain hospitals and the insurance plan is saying, we're gonna send all of the people who have our insurance policy to you, to you, hospital A. And hospital A is saying, okay, then we'll give you a discount on what we charge for our services. And that's why you see policy saying, these are the two hospitals you can go to. And if you wanna go to a doctor, these are the 10 doctors that we'll cover who are pulmonologists or endocrinologists or gastroenterologists. And so you really wanna make sure that the plan you are purchasing, if you do have a choice, will cover the doctors you wanna see, the hospital you wanna to go to, and the CF clinic, um, definitely, if you're going to a CF clinic. Uh, and you know, years ago, there was not these, these contracts between insurers and hospitals and medical providers, but for the most part, most plans are gonna restrict where you go and where you can go. Some plans like a PPO plan may give you more choice, but you really wanna make sure if you have a choice between plans, make sure that the people you want to have treating you are gonna be covered because it's much harder to get an exception to go to a doctor or a hospital that doesn't have a contract with the insurance company. Copay assistance is another um, issue for people with CF. Uh, and I yesterday I talked to, I don't know, 15 people, and five of them said they had no idea that there was specific copay assistance for people with CF. So I know there are um, quite a lot of CF uh, care team members that are listening right now and hopefully listening in the future. Um, so just I know the CF care teams usually are doing a great job letting people know about copay assistance. Um, and so make sure that you talk to your CF care team to make sure there's not any copay assistance you don't know about. So the main one people know about is called Healthwell Foundation, and that provides right now up to $15,000 for certain medication copays. And that's very a very helpful program. They do have income cutoffs. So, you know, if you make $2 million, you won't be eligible for the health well grant, but presumably you'll have money to, to pay your co-pays. Um, but health well, there are some other foundations that are now offering co-pay assistance. So make sure you're aware of those and applying for them. There are some drug manufacturers that do offer co-pay assistance and um, they may have certain restrictions as to who is eligible for that assistance. Um, when people have hospital charges or charges for x-rays or clinics and they have a copay, there's not any copay assistance program right now that I know of that assists with those. So a, a separate foundation that would help you um, with a lot of hospital charges. I think there are small 
Um, often CF led, so a CF parent or a person with CF has a small group that gives small amounts of money to people who need copay assistance. But often you can ask the hospital either for a payment plan to pay the copay, or you can often ask if the hospital has charity care where they will waive some of the charges. Or they will, or they have funds where you use those funds to pay their copay. So um, that can be very helpful as well. So Cobra is a way that some people can use to extend their coverage if they lose their job. So if there's 20 or more employees and the employee has lost their job, then they will. Um, be able to cobra the insurance. Now you have to pay the premium, but it's a good way to bridge, have insurance until either you find another job or see if you can be eligible for an ACA plan. Um, you can get COBRA if you're terminated from employment for 18 months, death of the covered employee is 36 months, divorce or separation, 36 months, become eligible for SSDI, 29 months, and that bridges the gap between you becoming eligible and becoming up for SSDI and then becoming eligible for Medicare. And lastly, if you reach the limiting age on the policy. So if the policy says, most of them say you're on the policy till 26, which is under the Affordable Care Act, all policies are having to give you that um, up to 26 that they cover you. And then after that, you could then still cover your, your child who has CF um, for 36 more months. So that's really helpful to a lot of people. Um, there is special COVID pandemic extension of COBRA deadlines. No one seems to know about this, but it can be helpful. There's usually a 60 day period to elect COBRA. But during the outbreak COVID period, which started March 1st of 2020 and is still going on, if you miss that 60 day period to elect COBRA, you can still elect COBRA. So um, that's really helpful for someone who maybe thought they'd get another job and didn't or thought they could get Medicaid but couldn't get Medicaid um, in their state, they still may be able to go back on COBRA from their prior employer. The next way that is very helpful for extending coverage is our state laws that extend coverage if a adult child is considered disabled according to that state statute. So there are a lot of people who um, with CF, their child reaches the limiting age, so they reach the 26 and they don't COBRA because the child is incapable of self-support because of their medical condition and they're chiefly dependent on their parent one parent or both for support and maintenance. So you have to apply to be considered a disabled child by getting a form from the insurance company and you need to do it before you reach 26. Your doctor has to sign a form that says they think you are not capable of self-sustaining employment because of your physical or mental condition and you do not have to be receiving social security. You do, most um, states require that the parent show that they are paying 50% of support and maintenance for the child. So you can show that with food, you can show that with rent, you can show that with paying for insurance or co-pays, um, but usually you are gonna have to show that. Uh, and then you can extend the parent's insurance uh, until the child is capable of self-support. So this is really helpful for people with CF who may not be able to work enough to self-support. Maybe they can only work part-time and they're making $1,000 a month and they want to stay on their parents' policy. But you must do this before you reach the limiting age. You can't do it five years before you reach 26 because they're assessing at very close to when you're turning 26, I say two or three months, 
does the doctor say that you cannot self-support? But it, some doctors don't understand you don't have to show you're on social security. It's just that you have to show you're not capable of self-sustaining employment. So if you're working full time, making $90,000, you're going to be capable of self-sustaining employment and you wouldn't be able to be a disabled child. Okay, so let's just quickly talk about social security benefits, um, which I, I have talked about in another CFRI um, webcast. So for a more extensive review of that, you can refer to that webcast. Um, but social security disability, you have to work a certain amount of time, paid through payroll deductions into the social security fund. You have to meet certain medical requirements and you have to be unable and not performing more than substantial gainful activity, which is working more than 20 hours a week and making more than 1,310 a month. So in January, that 1,310 is gonna go up a little. I think it's gonna go up $20, but it may be $30. Um, but right now it's 1310. So if you're young with CF or you're old with CF and you haven't worked that much or you haven't worked at all, you won't be able to get social security disability insurance because you won't have a work record that makes you eligible for social security disability. So then the question is, could you get SSI, which has the same medical requirements as SSDI, but doesn't require that you've worked um, and you still can't be engaging in substantial gainful activity for adults, or if you're a child, children can get SSI if their health meets the medical requirements. And for a child, they have to be living in a low income household. And then the child has to show that they meet either one of the criteria listed in the medical listing, the social security medical listing, or that their condition is as severe as that listing. So social security disability gives you a benefit based on how much you've contributed. That's why if you go online on social media, people are saying, I get a thousand dollars. And then people call me and say, why am I only getting $900? Well, because for social security disability, everybody's getting a different amount depending on how much they've worked. Um, 29 months after you become disabled. So social security finds you were disabled as of a certain date. You go to the next full month and you count forward 29 months and that's when you get Medicare. So a lot of people think you get Medicare right away, but you have to meet that 29 month waiting period. During that period, you could either cover the insurance or you could um, purchase an ACA plan. And to get the full 29 months, you have to show your social security award letter within the first 18 months of not being able to work. So that's a really important thing. So for SSI, the maximum federal benefit right now is 794, but often you are have a reduced amount if you're working part-time for every $2 you make, they reduce your check by a dollar. Or if people are giving you money, they reduce your check by that amount. Or if you're not paying rent to the person that you're living with, they reduce your check by 30%. So people with SSI also are getting different amounts. If you live in California, you get a state supplement. So you're getting about 200 more dollars than 794. And if you live in New York, you're getting um, about $124 more. Um, that's because those states are giving their own extra money to people who are on SSI who live in that state. When you're on SSI, you get Medicaid. That's what a lot of people want because Medicaid pays for all of your medication, all of your medical costs. There's no premiums and there's no co-pays. So SSI is, the, is, is one of the ways that people are getting Medicaid. Um, in 38 states, you can get Medicaid just by being low income, but in the 12 states that were in yellow, I probably should have been in red, in those states, you, the only way you're going to get Medicaid if you're an adult um, is 
full Medicaid is if you are on SSI. So if you're pregnant and low income, you can get Medicaid for the period of your pregnancy to cover the pregnancy costs. That's the only other time you're going to see um, people getting Medicaid outside of being in, in one of those 12 states. Sorry. Okay. Um, so the other thing for SSI is there's very specific income rules. And so if you're on SSI, please, please make sure you know what the asset limits are. So 2,000 for an individual, or if you're a single adult with a child, 2,000 or 3,000 for two adults and two and, and uh, one child or a hundred children. It doesn't go beyond 3,000 in terms of resource limit. And you can have one car and one house. So they, they follow your bank account online. They see if you have more money. And that's the way people um, often lose SSI. So make sure you understand what the income and resource limit are. And if you need the Medicaid and the SSI, don't go over that amount. Okay, so um, we have about 10 more minutes of talking and we're gonna talk about two programs that allow you to return to work and either keep Medicaid or keep Medicare. Um, and the first program is called 1619B. And the program is called 1619B because that's the section of the social security law section 1619B that allows someone on SSI to return to work and make more than that 1310 a month from work. And the person doesn't get the SSI monthly cash benefit, but the person continues to get Medicaid. And the work monthly income is higher than what regular Medicaid in one of the 38 states that offers low-income Medicaid, the person can make more money than if they were just on low-income Medicaid, and they can make more money than if they were getting the SSI cash benefit. So this is really, really helpful to people with CF who want to work but need to keep the Medicaid. And the other really nice thing is that if you become unable to uh, work, Social Security can start your SSI check again. This is the only type of Social Security where that happens. So a lot of times people tell me, I went back to work three years ago. And now I just need them to turn my Social Security disability back on. And that can't be done, you have to reapply. But if you're on 1619B, you are able to um, turn your cash benefit back on if because of your health issues, you become unable to work. So who's eligible for 1619B? You have to be on SSI and be considered disabled by social security. And you have to still meet the medical eligibility criteria and the non-medical eligibility criteria. So um, it doesn't mean you only have to have low PFTs. You can either meet one of the listed criteria or you can show that you're as severe as the criteria. So you also have to be a state resident. So of where, so if you're getting SSI and you live in Colorado, they're gonna, Colorado's gonna have a certain max you can make from work. New York's gonna have a different amount. Texas is gonna have a different amount. Each state has their own max amount for work. Um, for California, it's $47,000 max if you're on 1619B. For Texas, it's about 36,000, but it's much more than just, medic, just being on Medicaid the um, max amount for work. But you do have to stay at that resource limit. So you still have to have less than $2,000 in assets. You can have one house and one car um, or 3,000 for an individual and a spouse or an individual and a child.
So, so that's if you go to ssa.gov slash disability research slash WI slash 1619B, that's where you can find the list of all the different states and how much money your max amount you can make from work. Um, a lot of people, even at Social Security, don't know what 1619B is, but it's on their website and it's in the law. So you just have to find someone there who knows about it. And before you return to working a whole bunch, uh, more than 20 hours a week, more than 1310, you would want to call Social Security to tell them you want to make sure on their computer screen they have categorized you as being under 1619B. It's not automatic. So some people are told by Social Security, oh yeah, well, once you start making over, we'll put you on 1619B, but that doesn't happen. And then you lose your benefit and then you can't go on 1619B and you lose your Medicaid. So you wanna talk to Social Security before you start working over the allowable amount. Um, you can be assessed for your medical eligibility when you ask about 1619B. We don't hear of that happening very often, but what you wanna do always if you're on social security is make sure that your clinic visit notes are talking about limitations you have because of your health. Because we see a lot of medical records like thousands of pages of medical records a month when we're assessing people for help with social security. And it's very rare that we see a good record that talks about your limitations. How long does it take you to do your treatments? Listing each treatment on how long it takes. How long does it take to do airway clearance? Are you doing sinus washes? Do you have to take a midday nap? Do you have interrupted sleep? Do you have a lot of time managing your diabetes? It all needs to be in your clinic visit note. And that means you each visit, you have to make sure that your clinic is typing that in. This is the biggest problem people are having with staying on social security when they're being reviewed. Um, and people just tell me, well, my clinic knows that. And I say, okay, but it's not in the record and social security doesn't know it. So you do have to tell your clinic and just tell them like, I need you to type this in and watch them type it basically. Uh, because, because otherwise, you know, the clinics, God bless them, they're doing just a fantastic job and they are stretched really thin. Um, but if you don't tell them to type something in about your limitations, they're not going to remember that a year ago you told them it takes, it takes you two hours to do uh, treatments or that you take a midday nap or you fall asleep when you come back from work uh, if you're working part time. So the key for Social Security is medical records that are describing your daily limitations. So um, 1619B is going to end if you're no longer disabled. So you don't meet any criteria. You're not as severe as the criteria or you have too much in assets or resources or you've moved to a different state. If you move to a different state before you move, you wanna get the new state's criteria and then make sure that you're enrolled under the new state um, where you've moved to. So let's see. So we want to talk quickly about Medicare. So if you're on social security disability, you've been on for 29 months, you get Medicare. Um, and you want to make sure you understand 1619B deals with SSI, Medicare work incentives deal with SSDI, totally different things, okay? So SSDI, you are having the possibility of working over the allowable of 1310 a month and getting a trial work month or up to nine months where you're making over the allowable of 1310 and you're trying to see if that works for your health, are you able to do it? Or do you find out, oh, maybe part-time is better for me. So the, 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 the important thing to understand is that you don't get a mandatory nine months. Even though online it may sound like you do, you don't. It's a permissive 
nine months, meaning they can give you nine months of working over the allowable, but they don't have to. And often what they do is after they see you're working three months, two, three months, four months over the allowable, they send you a letter saying your benefits have been terminated. If your benefits are terminated, your Medicare is terminated, and then you can't get the Medicare back. You can't ask for Medicare continued eligibility um, once your benefits have stopped. So before you start working over the allowable, if you're going to stop your Social Security, you want to call if you want to keep Medicare and ask for extended Medicare coverage. And that gives you eight and a half years as your maximum of continued Medicare. Now, at some point, Social Security could see, do you still meet the medical criteria? It's very rare for them to do that, but they could do that. Um, but most people are getting eight and a half years of continuing the Medicare, even though they've stopped the SSDI benefit. So, be careful when you're thinking of going back to work if you're on SSDI. I mean, certainly you can contact us at the CF Legal Information Hotline and we can go over this with you. A lot of people um, think that if they go back to work, they get off Social Security disability, they read online that it says that there is expedited review if you go off social security disability, you're gonna get an expedited review if you need to go back on benefits. But the expedited review right now is taking in most states about 12 months, which is not exactly what you would think is expedited, but social security has a lot of cases right now. So it's not so quick in most states. I mean, certainly if you're talking about South Dakota where there's not that many people, it might be um, rather expedited, but in most major cities, it's about 12 months. And you still are gonna have to show that you meet the medical criteria or your condition is as severe as the medical criteria. So don't be fooled by thinking you can just say, oh yeah, I went back to work for a year, just put me back on. They're gonna assess your medical condition. Um, and it, and it, it's their definition of expedited may not be your definition of expedited. I guess that, that's, um, <clears throat> that's a good way to, to say it. Um, so that's a very, it seemed like, Seemed like it went by very quickly. Um, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions and I'm happy to answer the questions. Um, and there certainly are other things related to insurance that I was not able to speak about. Um, I will also say that um, uh, the CF Roundtable, if you don't get the CF Roundtable, I suggest you go to www.cfroundtable.com. It's free. It's a magazine put out by people with CF, for people with CF. And I do write a column for CF Roundtable. And I write a lot about these issues. I do blog posts as well. And there's going to be a blog post shortly about 1619B. But that's a really good idea, uh, a really good way to keep up with um, new things that are coming up and related to insurance and social security is to subscribe to CF Roundtable.